You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 7, 2017, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, pulmonary function tests. Our presenter is Dr. Gary Salzman. He's the Director of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Truman Medical Center in Kansas City, Missouri. with the objectives here of what we're going to do today and we're going to talk about several different things. The rest of the uh, let me just kind of move some of this stuff out of the way here. Okay, so I want you to become familiar with the physiology of, of some of the PFTs, distinguish between obstructive and restrictive disorders, and be familiar with the indication uh, for pulmonary function tests. So when we talk about PFTs, we can talk about really three different types of things. We talk about volumes, we talk about flow rates, and airway hyperreactivity. Uh, we can also look at diffusion capacity that tells us about gas exchange. And if we wanted to draw blood gas, we can also look at gas exchange. But today, we're really going to be talking about the lung as a mechanical object, and we're going to talk about volumes and flows uh, and airway hyperreactivity. So um, when we're looking at PFTs, we're looking to evaluate whether this is a restrictive, uh, obstructive, or a mixed pattern. We want to know the quantification of the impairment. Um, we want to do this sometimes as a preoperative assessment for patients to look at their risk associated with surgery. And we can also look at this in terms of disability evaluation also. So just to get some definitions uh, out of the way, we've got uh, residual volume, which is the volume of air in the lungs after a ma maximal exhalation. A residual volume we can only detect using lung volume, so we'd have to do more than just uh, spirometry. Uh, expiratory reserve volume is the maximum amount of volume of air expired from a resting and expiratory level. This we can uh, identify uh, with simple spirometry, and this is an important number, uh, particularly uh, in uh, explaining sometimes patients that have dyspnea but don't have any uh, obstruction. Uh, extra reserve volume is reduced in patients that are obese and are having restrictive uh, problems uh, based on obesity. So oftentimes patients that are obese will have marked reduction in the expiratory reserve volume, which may be the only abnormality on their spirometry, which may suggest that their uh, exertional dyspnea may be related to a reduction in, uh, in ERV. So this is an important number, the expiratory reserve volume something that you ought to look at. Tidal volume is just uh, what we're breathing uh, in and out with each breath as we're all sitting here today. Inspiratory reserve volume, the maximum volume of air inspired from a resting end inspiratory level. Inspiratory capacity, maximum volume of air inspired from an end expiratory uh, level. Vital capacity, and this is the number, the force vital capacity that we're looking at when we do spirometry. When they have the patient take a deep breath in and blow as hard and fast as they can at until they can't blow out anymore. And inspiratory vital capacity is the same thing only during inspiration. Inspiratory uh, capacity will tell you more about upper airway resistance and problems when you're having reductions there. It may be related to upper airway uh, obstruction. FRC. Uh, again, you would have to uh, have uh, lung volume measurements. So you'd have to go over and above uh, simple spirometry to, to determine the volume of air remaining in the lungs at the end expiratory level. And then total lung capacity, a uh, volume of air in the lungs after maximal uh, inspiration. So this kind of gives us a, a kind of um, view of what the different values are. So total lung capacity is all the whole amount of, lung, of uh, volume in the lung. 
that's the PLC, total lung capacity. You can see the tidal volume is just the normal breathing that we're doing as we're sitting here. Then if we take a deep breath in as, hard, as much as we can, uh, we get inspiratory reserve volume. And then as we blow all of that uh, air out, we get uh, uh, forced vital capacity. Uh, and then um, expiratory reserve volume is uh, the amount of air that comes out after normal, inspira after normal expiration. And then uh, FRC includes uh, residual volume. And as we talked about, this residual volume we cannot measure during spirometry. We would have to get a separate test for lung volumes. So these are kind of the basic different types of, of volumes that we, that we look at. So um, in addition to volumes, we have flow rates, too. And flow rates uh, would say, how much volume are you exhaling over a certain amount of time? And the one you're most familiar with is the FEV1 which is the forced expiratory volume in one second. So the patient blows out as hard and fast as they can in one second, and we measure that volume in one second during a, a forceful exhalation, starting at total lung capacity. Forced vital capacity is the volume of spite during a, uh, during a um, rapid forced exhalation starting at full inspiration. Join us from 1130 until 1 p.m. So the FEF2575 is this forced expiratory flow between 25 and 75 percent of uh, FBC. So it's the mean rate of expiratory flow uh, basically in the middle of the forced vital capacity. And that may give us some understanding of small airways. The FEV1 really reflects more large airway function whereas the 2575 gives us a more um, uh, idea about uh, uh, large airways FEV1, small airways is FEF 2575. Uh, the ratio we look at is a percentage of FEV1 to FEC ratio, flow volume loop, and volume time graph. Those are some of the things that, that we're going to look at. So, when you're reading a pulmonary functions test, uh, you have to ask these questions. Um, and the first one is, is the test even interpretable? We have to have a valid test. If the test isn't valid, then we can't really give any kind of interpretation. And several requirements for a valid test. One is the patient has to have an expiratory time at least six seconds. We have to have the patient be able to blow out at least six seconds in order to get an adequate test. If the patient doesn't have an adequate expiratory time, that would underestimate your forced vital capacity, and it could um, really markedly change your FEV1 to FEC ratio, making it appear higher than it actually is. So the patient really should breathe out at least six seconds in order for it to be interpretable. The other thing is that we want reproducibility. We want the patient to be able to get the same numbers, plus or minus about 5% on each effort, and be uh, repeatable at least three times. The reason that's important is that we do have patients that come in and are looking uh, for disability and may give a suboptimal uh, effort. Well, it's virtually impossible to give the exact same suboptimal uh, effort three times in a row. Uh, you may get a 50% effort and then a 60% effort and then a 30% effort. And so the numbers are going to be variable. And when we have that much variability, we say, well, really, the numbers aren't reproducible. It, it's not interpretable. So if a patient tries as hard as they can and gives maximum effort, generally they're going to be able to reproduce within about 5% uh, the numbers on each of, of three attempts. So we, we look at uh, reproducibility as a uh, test of whether the, the test is, is adequate and interpretable. Uh, the next question that we ask are the results normal. If everything's normal, and normal meaning you know, within the 95% confidence intervals in terms of the population we're looking at, uh, that you know, we would stop there. If it's not normal, then we want to know the pattern and severity of the abnormality. Is it obstructive? Is it restrictive? Or is it both? And then what does this mean for the patient in terms of diagnosis and treatment? So those are some of the uh, general approach to interpretation of a pulmonary function test. So 
Acceptable spirometry, we want a smooth, continuous curve. We want a good early effort, a rapid upstroke to a slightly rounded, sharp peak flow, and then time to peak flow, we want less than 120 milliseconds. And we want a good end of test. We want an upward concavity at the end of the exhalation on the flow volume loop. We want a plateau of volume change over time in the volume time curve, and at least six seconds of expiratory time we just talked about. So we'll look at those curves and, and we'll see. Now these are acceptable curves. And the first one is the flow volume. And so on the expiratory lamp, again, we want a really sharp upstroke. And this is our peak flow here. And you might think, well, the peak flow here is about 9 liters per second, which is different than the peak flows that patients get on their handheld um, peak flow meters, because those are liters per minute on the handheld peak flow. And so when you get uh, a peak flow on spirometry, it's going to be in liters per second. So here it would be 9. And so you would have to multiply that times 60, and you would get um, 540 in this patient for their for their peak flow, 9, nine times 60, um, which would be 540 um, liters per minute. So this is, uh, this is the peak flow. Uh, and then you get this peak. And then uh, as, uh, as the patient um, uh, exhales volume, the flow rates will, will start to decrease. We also want to look at the time volume curve. So you can see we want uh, very quickly within, uh, like we said, about um, 21 milliseconds to get to um, uh, the volume here. And then we have a plateau. And we want to see the patient breathe out at least six seconds. So a six-second exhalation time would uh, be what we're looking for in terms of acceptable spirometry. So these, these uh, curves are acceptable. And that's the first thing that I look at in the pulmonary function test. I look at the graphics and look at the flow volume loop and look at uh, the volume time curve to make sure that we're having an adequate effort and the test is interpretable. So normal results are defined by the 95% confidence range. And normal range uh, is basically where 95% of healthy people will fall. And we look at these depending on their height. And height is probably the biggest predictor on pulmonary function. And then we look at age, sex, a racial, and ethnic background. And this is important. I've interpreted PFTs where they have the wrong height on the patient and all the predicteds will be off. So height is very important in terms of getting percent predicted. So how do we approach this? So the first thing we want to look at is the FEB1, FEC ratio and whether it's reduced or not. And so um, the gold guidelines uh, published a long time ago about COPD defined obstruction in COPD as a ratio of less than 70%. Um, and that's probably reasonable for COPD patients who are usually in their 50s and 60s, where an FEV1, FEC ratio below 70 would indicate obstruction. But this cannot be used in, in everyone, because uh, as uh, people are younger, the FEV1, FEC ratio will be normally higher. So in young people in their 20s and 30s, the FEV1, FEC ratio may be 80 or 85 percent normal. So what we look at is there's a percent predicted for the ratio. If that's less than 95% of the predicted, then we would indicate that that's obstruction. So basically, we want to see what the predicted ratio is for that patient's age. And then um, if it's below 95% of that predicted, that would be obstruction. So if the ratio is reduced, the answer would be yes, this is obstruction. The problem with using 70% here, which some people do, is that you're going to um, underdiagnose obstruction in very young people. And actually, you're going to overdiagnose obstruction in, in elderly patients. So using a, a flat number 70% was is not recommended. What we recommended is looking at less than 95% predicted for that patient's age. And that would be printed on the, uh, the uh, results so that you can determine if they're obstructed. If the FEV, if the force vital capacity, if the ratio is normal, then we look at force vital capacity. If the force vital capacity is reduced, that could be restrictive. If the force vital capacity is not reduced, then we're looking at a normal test where the ratio is normal and FEC is normal. Uh, they would all be normal. 
So severity on obstruction, we look at FEV1. And uh, numbers between 65 and 80 percent would be mild obstruction. Uh, between 50 and 65 is moderate. Between 35 and 50 is severe obstruction. And less than 34 percent on the FEV1 would indicate very severe uh, obstruction. So bronchodilator response, uh, we do this um, to, uh, to see whether there is airway hyperreactivity. So after we do spirometry, then um, we will give the patient uh, albuterol uh, and then uh, wait about 20 minutes and then see whether we have a response in terms of FEV1 uh, improvement after bronchodilator. So this is helpful to predict steroid responsiveness in patients with COPD. Uh, it's helpful um, to diagnose uh, um, airway hyperreactivity, which is uh, the hallmark of asthma. Remember, though, if a patient has taken their short-acting beta agonist within a few hours of when they get the test, uh, they may not show a significant improvement because they're already basically a post-bronchodilator study if they took their, their medicine before they came in. So generally, we recommend that they withhold uh, their um, short-acting beta agonist on the day that they come in for um, pre and post uh, spirometry so that we don't get a false negative. So the significant response, bronchodilator response, is uh, an increase in FEV1 or FEC of greater than 12% and 200 milliliters. So why do we add the 200 milliliters on that? The reason we do that is that if you start with a very low FEV1, uh, you may get to 12%, but it still may not be significant. So the, uh, the corollary to that would be if you have a patient that only has an FEV1 that's one liter, and they increase by 120 milliliters, that would be 12% but it would not be 200 milliliters. It would still be only a small increase. So the requirement is that you have both. So in order, if a patient has an FEV1 of 1,000 cc's, they would need at least uh, an increase to 1,200 uh, on their uh, post-FEV1 to uh, qualify for being a bronchodilator response. So at low FEV1s, uh, we can um, this 12% may be misleading, so that's why it has to be 12% and 200 milliliter increase in either the FEV1 or the FEC, either one. Now, restriction abnormalities are usually based on the total lung capacity, and total lung capacity between 65 and 80 is mild, between 50 and 65 is moderate, and less than 50% would be severe restriction based on the total lung capacity. Uh, if the total lung capacity is not available, in other words, you don't do lung volumes, then the reduction on the FEC can be interpreted as a, as a restriction of the volume uh, excursion of the lung. So we'll look at forced vital capacity. Although it's not as good as TLC, we can still look at FEC, forced vital capacity. So these are several different uh, flow volume loops in, in different patterns. And so uh, we've got the, the normal pattern here and the dark line here. This would be uh, kind of a normal pattern here. Uh, this pattern on the left would be emphysema, where you got uh, obstruction and you got hyperinflation. And so um, uh, this would be uh, obstruction. And then this would be a restrictive pattern, which looks like the normal pattern, but you're just having much lower uh, lung volumes in the restrictive pattern. So you can tell a lot by just looking at the, at the flow volume loop. So there are several different upper airway obstructive patterns that we look at uh, to look at um, uh, the function of the upper airway. And uh, we can look at really three different patterns, a fixed uh, uh, upper airway uh, pathology, variable extrathoracic, and variable intrathoracic. So when both the inspiratory and the expiratory limbs have flattening, that would be a fixed uh, upper airway obstruction. So here, um, this is inspiration uh, below the line here, and this is exhalation above the line. And basically, we have flattening on both ends, and this happened to be a, uh, a tumor uh, where it was in the, uh, in the upper airway. Uh, 
that basically was a fixed tumor where the patient was having both obstruction on the expiratory limb and the inspiratory limb. So this is a fixed uh, obstruction. And uh, we get basically flattening on the inspiratory loop and the expiratory loop. Uh, variable extrathoracic um, is probably in the most common pattern where you get a flattened inspiratory limb. Uh, this would be a patient that would be presenting with inspiratory strider. So as you can see, the expiratory uh, limb of the flow volume loop is completely normal. So exhalation is completely normal. But when the patient goes to inhale, uh, this is completely flattened. So we see this in vocal cord dysfunction. This is kind of the classic pattern that we would see in vocal cord dysfunction where the vocal cords aren't functioning properly and they would come together during inspiration and we would have um, this flattening. Also, if you have um, vocal cord paralysis of one vocal cord, for example, then you would uh, get this type of pattern. Um, and so basically as you inspire, uh, the vocal cords are coming together and you're getting obstruction, but then as you exhale, uh, the upper airway uh, expands and you get a normal exhalation loop. So that's a variable extrathoracic obstruction, and that would be uh, characterized by a flattened inspiratory loop, as you can see right here. Now, variable intrathoracic is really not very common. Uh, this would be a ball valve-like uh, obstruction below the vocal cords. So say in the trachea, where you would have, say, a benign tumor that was flopping back and forth. And here the obstruction worsens during exhalation. So the inspiratory loop is completely normal, whereas the expiratory loop is flattened. Uh, and this uh, would be a situation where this is within the chest cavity, so as the patient inspires, uh, the ball valve mechanisms opens up so the patient gets normal flow, but during exhalation it will collapse and then you would get uh, obstruction on the exhalation limb. But this is not, not a very common finding unless you have a, a basically um, ball valve type of um, uh, tumor, usually benign tumor of the trachea. So lung volumes. Um, we talked about so far spirometry, but we can also measure volume. So we can't measure residual volume with spirometry. Uh, we need uh, to measure lung volume. So what we do is we measure functional residual capacity, and uh, basically we calculate residual volume by functional residual capacity minus expiratory reserve volume. And there's two different ways that we can measure functional uh, residual capacity. We can use helium dilution. When the patient breathes in helium, it gets diluted, and then they exhale it, and we measure the concentration of helium, and we can calculate uh, the lung, uh, lung volumes. We can calculate uh, functional residual capacity. Problem with helium dilution is that helium dilution uh, will only uh, measure areas of lung that are adequately um, ventilated. So if you have severe airflow obstruction and you have emphysematous blebs like in COPD where you don't, where you have narrowed airways to these big uh, blebs, you'll underestimate the total lung capacity. And so for emphysema, the helium dilution may not give us an accurate measurement of total lung capacity. It may underestimate our total lung capacity. So we generally don't use uh, helium. We use body plasmography. And I'll talk about body plasmography. Here's the formula for it, any kind of math wizards there, but you do not need to know this. I thought I would give it to you just for fun, but you do not need to know this. Uh, Boyle's Law is basically uh, what we're looking at, the sum of the uh, pressures and volume um, basically uh, have to match. So what we, um, what we do for um, plasmography is we have the patient uh, step into a box and we close the door. Uh, so patients that have um, uh, claustrophobia are not going to be able to uh, tolerate uh, being in one of these boxes. So um, that kind of excludes it. The other patients that may not be able to get body plasmography is if they're morbidly obese and too big to actually fit into the box. Uh, but if they can get into the box and they're not claustrophobic, uh, we get them in there. And we uh, seal the box. And so then we know the volume in the box. We can measure the pressure in the box. When we have the patient uh, put their mouth on the shutter in this pneumotachograph, 
So we measure the pressure in the lungs, and so then we can calculate the volume in their lungs because we know pressure and volume in the box, we measure pressure in their lungs, and we can calculate the volume in the lungs. And that will give us the entire volume of their lungs, including the areas that are not very well ventilated because uh, we don't have to worry about uh, helium going into all the lungs. It's just basically uh, changes in pressure and volume, which will be the total volume in the lung. Pressure volume loop. So the other thing that we look at is diffusion capacity. So we use carbon monoxide, very, very small amounts of carbon monoxide, not enough to hurt anybody. Uh, because carbon monoxide, as you know, um, binds very uh, quickly and very avidly to hemoglobin. So there's not an issue of uh, binding. And what we're basically measuring is the transfer of that carbon monoxide from the alveolus to the capillary blood. And that depends on the alveolar capillary surface area. So it gives us an idea of uh, we're calculating how well oxygen can cross that alveolar capillary membrane uh, to get into the blood. And we use carbon monoxide because it's, it's so tightly bound to hemoglobin. Um, this is the formula for DLCO. Again, you don't need to know that. And so some of the factors uh, affecting diffusion, uh, decreased uh, diffusion would go along with low lung volume. So Obviously, if you have a patient that's had one lung taken out and only has one lung, their diffusion would only be 50% of normal. Um, we do correct it for lung volume, so there's an uncorrected diffusion and a corrected diffusion for lung volume. So that patient that, say, has lost one lung due to trauma, if we look at their corrected diffusion, it should be normal uh, if we correct it for lung volume. If we don't correct it, it would be only about half of, of what it should be. Uh, anemia will also decrease diffusion. Uh, we don't uh, normally measure hemoglobin, so we usually give a, a disclaimer that since we didn't measure hemoglobin, we don't know that if they are anemia, anemic, that could decrease their diffusion. If they've recently smoked, if they have COPD, particularly with emphysema, that will decrease their diffusion. Elevated diffusion goes along with polycythemia, so if you've got too much blood. Uh, alveolar hemorrhage, so if there's blood in the alveoli, those alveoli, the blood that's in the lungs, will take up the carbon monoxide. That will actually give you an elevated diffusion. And then at increased altitude will also elevate uh, your diffusion capacity. So decrease uh, in diffusion are uh, diseases affecting the interstitial spaces, uh, sarcoidosis, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, diseases uh, uh, affecting the, the um, blood flow through the lungs, pulmonary embolism. Um, pneumocystis, uh, emphysema, all these would cause decreases in diffusion. Increases in diffusion could go along with mild heart failure, uh, asthma, and that's one way that you can differentiate asthma from COPD is where asthma usually will have uh, an increased or normal diffusion, whereas COPD with emphysema will have a decreased in diffusion. Uh, exercise, it will go up, and in cardiac left to right shunt. So we'll talk a little bit about bronchoprovocation. So there are many patients that you'll get, and they have a history that may be suggestive of asthma, but when you bring them in to the office and do spirometry, a pre and post bronchodilator, you get completely normal results. You get really no uh, uh, significant abnormalities and no apparent response to bronchodilators. And so instead of completely ruling out asthma based on the spirometry, then the next step is to do a bronchoprovocation test, um, which generally used in a pulmonary function lab is methacholine. Right now that's the only commercially available uh, product. We used to have mannitol. It's no longer available. Uh, Histamine is only used in kind of experimental uh, labs. Some labs use exercise or cold air. Uh, allergen channels can be very, very dangerous because you have to worry about a late phase response. In fact, there was a death about uh, eight or nine years ago, Johns Hopkins, from an allergen bronchoprovocation test. So this is not a routine test. And it's a research test, and, and most labs do not do that. But our lab, uh, we only use methacholine uh, in terms of uh, bronchoprovocation. So, when we do methacholine, we want to look at uh, inhalation of increasing concentrations of methacholine from 0.5 milligrams per milliliter to 16 milligrams per milliliter. So we uh, 
start very, very low uh, because uh, obviously we don't want uh, to start at a high dose and then to have bronchospasm from the beginning. And we measure FEV1 after each inhalation. And a, a positive test is a, a drop in FEV1 or FEC uh, by 20% from baseline. So we're looking at a 20% fall in FEV1 or FEC after the inhalation of a concentration of um, methacholine. And then we uh, calculate the PC20. So um, PC20 um, of 8 gives us about a specificity of about 50% for asthma when the PC20 is 8, which means that at 8 milligrams per milliliter, we get a 20% drop in FEV1 or FEC. Um, sensitivity is actually very good, close to 100% with very few false negatives. Uh, the big reason for a false negative occurring is when medications are not omitted. So again, if a patient receives a short-acting beta agonist right before they come in for a methacholine challenge test, that test can be a false negative because they're already having a bronchodilator uh, being effective in their lungs. Same is true if they're on a long-acting beta agonist. As you know, that has a longer duration of action, and we generally recommend um, withholding long-acting beta agonists for at least three days. Uh, when uh, we do um, methacholine challenges. Inhaled steroids may even have a longer effect, maybe even up to two weeks, um, that would continue to uh, uh, affect the patient and may produce a false negative. But if the patient is not on any uh, medications at all, uh, then uh, the sensitivity is very, very good. Specificity, though, um, there's quite a few reasons for false positives. Uh, you guys see a lot of allergic rhinitis. Allergic rhinitis alone can give you a false positive methacholine challenge, cystic fibrosis, a heart failure, COPD, smoking, viral infections. All those things can you give you a false positive a methacholine challenge. In fact, anywhere between 1 and 7% of the population have uh, a positive test, and uh, about a fourth of smokers will show a positive methacholine challenge. So, most of the time when I order a methacholine challenge, my purpose is to rule out asthma. That my clinical suspicion is that they do not have asthma, and I'm doing the test to rule it out, and that's why we go up to 16 milligrams. Uh, most patients that would have asthma should have some fall in their uh, FEV1 and FEC when we go up to 16 milligrams per milliliter. And so it really is a pretty good test to rule out asthma. In terms of ruling it in, uh, PC20 of 4, which gives you a higher specificity, so it could give you a 80 to 90 percent specificity. Um, but there's obviously some, some causes for false positive. But a methacholine challenge can be very helpful, and I think it's important to have objective evidence. If you believe that a patient doesn't have asthma, then they shouldn't be on asthma medicine. I mean, if they have vocal cord dysfunction, if they have something else, then we need to make that diagnosis and treat that not just empirically treat uh, asthma based on symptoms, but have some objective test, either on pre and post barometry that shows a 12% and 200 milliliter increase, or methacholine challenge uh, that shows um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, decrease in uh, FEV1 or FEC by 20%. Uh, when you get up to 16 milligrams, if you do get a positive and you kind of are in a kind of no man's land where you haven't ruled out asthma, but you may not have completely ruled it in. But really the main reason for the methacholine challenge test is to, uh, to rule out asthma if you're thinking the patient does not have it. It's better sensitivity than specificity. So that's what I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have.